Hi, welcome to the Christian Indie Writers Podcast, where we inform, encourage, and support Christian indie authors on their journey to publication. I'm Jamie Hirschberger. I write short fiction under the pen name J.R. Nichols. Hi, I'm Rhonda Hagerman, and I write fiction and nonfiction. Hi, I'm Christina Katane, and I write Christian dystopian fiction. And I'm Jennifer Calatone. <laughs> when I'm not playing softball, I write historical <laughs> romance. Oh my God. <laughs> All right, put that back up by your face again. Mm. Oh, look, and you picked such a beautiful picture. Oh, we can't have the real Jennifer with us today because of an incident she had in the, on the softball field. Is that right, Tina? Yep, yep, she tripped and hurt her face and she's actually at the doctor's office right now trying to in, participate in our chat. So that's gonna be fun. <laughs> I wonder. I that. know. I've got to know. Well, <laughs> she's laughing right now, so that's a good thing. <laughs> and I had a choice of so many great photographs. She is really lucky. I was in a good mood last night and gave her that one. <laughs> to be honest, though, uh, we went and did a bunch of headshots, and I was looking to see if I could pull up something different for myself. And like, all of my pictures are strangely expressioned and the rest of you all are so photogenic it's ridiculous you guys are all so beautiful but anyway we're sad that we don't have the real live uh jennifer tong with us today but um if everybody would just say a prayer for her because you know they they just want to check her out make sure everything is good and we are praying for a good outcome as well is that not right ladies yep yes so we will treat that as Jennifer's What's Up, where we check in with one another about our personal lives. And uh, since we know what's up with our friend Jen, what's up with our friend Rhonda? Well, let's see. Um, gardening. That's always up with me at this time of year. <laughs> and um, my husband, he's already given me my Mother's Day gifts. And they were accessories for my greenhouse he bought me for my birthday last year. Oh. And I'm so excited. I feel like a real adult gardener now. I love it. <laughs> and That's yesterday, great. yesterday was his 60th birthday. And so we had a surprise party for him. Oh. So um, I've been planning it uh, for, I don't know, about two and a half weeks or so. So not a real long time, but uh, it was to happen at six o'clock last night. And from about noon on, I was just on a constant adrenaline rush because I was trying not to spill it. And he kept asking questions that would have made it totally spillable. <laughs> and uh, it's, oh my word. It was just so much fun though. So we had a great time with friends and family and stuff last night, so. Oh, that's great. So did you have it like at a location or? Yes, um, my niece and her husband own a restaurant here just right around the corner really from us. And that's where it was. So it was not really hard to get him to go there or did you have to come up with a pretense or what? Well, no, see, I made his mother hit my co-conspirator because Ooh. she wants to take us out to dinner for our birthdays every year. And you know, that's awesome. We totally will do that. And I knew she was the one person he would never turn down in Aww. case he wanted to do something different for his big birthday. <laughs> and so I said, Jan, can you just like invite him to dinner? And <laughs> he won't say no to you. I hear stories like that and my heart gets so happy because right now I'm my son's favorite and I know that that won't always be true, but I hope that I will be the one invitation he will never turn down. <laughs> yeah, he'll come back around, I tell you. Oh, that's so sweet. All right, well, uh, happy birthday to your husband and what's up with you, Tina? Okay, well, speaking of Mother's Day, I, you know, my husband and I like to tease each other a little bit and have some back and forth and stuff. He was like, what do you want to do for Mother's Day? We could go to one of those escape rooms. <laughs> I was like, well, I, I said, well, you could get me the, I saw this YouTube, this uh, video on Facebook with the silicone gloves that you use for washing dishes. And it has like the bristles built into the palms of the gloves. And it, there's this video of this lady washing dishes with the gloves and like <laughs> taking hot stuff out of the oven. I said, you could get me these. They were like 20 bucks. I said, or you could get me a book coach. And I screenshotted him the Author Accelerator webpage where they have like the different packages and how much they cost. And it, they were significantly more than 20 bucks. <laughs> and, um, and then he, so then he comes in here and said, yeah, we'll do the book coach thing. Oh, that's so, so nice. I never in a million years thought that he was going to do that. Um, I was actually saving it up, so I was going to pay for it myself. 
Um, so I, I have it a, I have a, I filled in the application to, to get a book coach and there, I have like a, vi a telephone conference uh, tomorrow at one to talk about Ooh, my application. So. That's so exciting. And you know, it's, it's really more than the gift. It's more of like a, I believe in your writing and I support you when someone does something like that. That's got to yeah. feel so good because it's not always just saying, oh, I support you. It's actions like that that really show it. That's really sweet. Oh. And, well, and to have a professional editor walk and coach me through the revision of my book, is just, I just feel like um, my book is going to like go up higher, not just so no, unhappy. Mm -hmm. Well, happy Mother's Day to you and to yeah. all of the moms watching. And um, I would just like to say for my What's Up, that I went to the Walmart bakery yesterday and picked out a delicious cake for my children and husband to give to me for Mother's Day. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> and then I sent them a text that said, thank you for this cake that you chose that I chose for you to choose to buy for me. <laughs> and of course they all thought that that was hilarious. And, um, also for my what's up, I would like to say I do have a sunburn in case you're wondering, and I'm so sad. No, I'm not because that means I've been running all my mom errands with the top down and the convertible and oh, how happy I am that we live in paradise. <laughs> I just have to say it's been just beautiful and wonderful here, uh, possibly a bit on the warm side for some people, but there's been lots of breeze. So it's just been a lovely spring. And also um, they say that you don't have seasons here, but I'm knowing that noticing that that's not true, particularly in the birds that have returned, um, which you would think the birds all go away at this time of year, but it isn't true. Like they have their own migratory patterns here and it's been really neat to um, experience that. So that's what, what Rana? Before we move on, I would just like to mention that Maria, she is posting <clears throat> that what's new with me is that my second novel is being published on May 30th Woo! or 30th oh, of awesome. May. She's English, you know, uh, far sooner than I thought. Also, I went public on my pen name today, so Facebook is going pretty crazy right now. No, oh, that's, that's so terrific. exciting. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, is she trad pub, does she say? Or did she is she publishing herself and, and it's her launch day? Or I wonder if she would type that in and just let us know. Mm -hmm. If she lets us know, I'll let you know. Awesome. Yeah, and thanks for keeping an eye on the chat. I, mm -hmm. I don't have a split brain to be able to do it. So thanks, ladies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to move into our topic du jour, which today is the art of short stories. And what's hilarious is, you know, um, we talked about this topic and I was like, I don't know if I have a lot to say, but that's really what I write. <laughs> so it was kind of embarrassing. But then, you know, as, as the topic kind of rolled around in my mind, I found I had a little bit more to say. But so um, glancing at this little outline we made here, um, what why would we want to write a short story at all? I mean, aren't we talking about publishing novels? Hmm. Well, I'll tell you why I want to write a short story. And it has a little bit to do with my um, improper beliefs, I guess, about what a short story should be. <clears throat> because I'm not a very wordy person anyway. And that means that I could say as much, maybe, as somebody else, but I would have a short story, say like a novella where somebody else would have a novel. Um, but that's not really what short story writing is all about. And that's what I've been learning about this week. So I'm so excited about this topic. So Rhonda, um, you did bring the topic to us. And w would you mind saying why this came up? Because I I, um, mm -hmm. I think it's an interesting little deal. Well, yes. Um, someone named Jamie in our writing group <laughs> uh, sent a writing prompt to us that was um, for market. And it, it would be nice to uh, earn money for some of my writing, um, like the my fiction writing, but um, I don't really expect it at this point. Um, but surprises are always nice. Uh, so anyway, this was a prompt about writing about uh, the Beatles, not in their regular setting. And uh, that's a very boiled down way of saying it. But anyway, that really intrigued me because honestly, I'm really not a Beatles fan, but my husband really is. And mm. someone I was friends with, actually saw last night, huge Beatle fan. So I know a lot about them because these people just won't shut up about them. So um, I was so you, really looking forward to putting heard, these Beatles in a, a setting that I wanted them to be in. 
Yes, because it's a call for speculative fiction, <clears throat> which the handy way that I explained it to my friends who have no idea what I'm talking about, I said, weird on purpose. <laughs> so you're saying that you knew people who knew a lot of Beatles, and so you knew vicariously through them a lot about mm -hmm. the Beatles, and you're like, yes. I can do this. I can write a weird story about yes, the Beatles. I, I can make them someone I like. Yes. Okay. And then you got into it and mm -hmm. you realized like what, because you came to us asking about this topic because you mm -hmm. ran into some sort of a log jam. Yeah. Well, I had pretty much the outline written in my head, but then I thought, well, you know, why don't I just actually research what should be in a short story? Because I don't want to get three quarters of the way through this and realize I've got to rewrite the whole thing. So the main thing that I came away with is there needs to be, not that there should be a big introduction in a long novel anyway, but it needs to be really abbreviated in the beginning. And then it, uh, from what I read, and I'd like to know your opinion, is it should be pretty much end right after the climax. And so that cuts, it's not so much that the writing is, um, the words are more sparse in the story. It's just that it's a shorter portion of the story. Mm -hmm. What do you think yeah. of that? Um, yes. So Tina, I would like for you to talk on that, but I would like the listeners to understand that this was a maximum word count of 4,000. And when you are writing for a call, you have to agree that your story won't be any longer than what they are asking for. Correct. So the issue is what do I keep? What's important? Um, mm -hmm. Tina, how do you feel about ending the story right after the climax? Well. I don't know. Um, I guess that I've never really thought about that as um, a rule for short stories. I've always thought of short stories of a, a, like a freeze frame, a moment in time within a bigger story. Hmm. Um, so that's interesting. Um, and I... I think when I was listening to Rhonda talk, the way that I would describe a short story is kind of like when you go to the store and you buy a can of Campbell's condensed chicken noodle soup, and then you have to add a whole bunch of water to it. Well, a short story is everything that you need in a story, but with all of the water boiled away. So it's an entire story, beginning, middle, and end, but told in a compact fashion. So um, that is how I would basically describe it. And I think that if you were going to start talking into the how to craft one, um, it, it's interesting if you start thinking about that there are elements that aren't necessary to be there to make your story work, correct? Right. right. And so I think that that's the tricky part is when you sit down and you just like shut off your inner editor and you tippity typity get those words down. Well, then what do you take out to make it fit the word count? Right. I mean, is that mm -hmm. is that your approach or do you have a different approach when you sit down to write short? Is that for Tina? It's okay. for either of you. Take it, Tina. <laughs> um, I guess that's not my approach. I kind of think about um, what it is that I'm focusing on. Um, so I, I actually wrote a blog post about this in on writingshorts.com. Dot net. I'm, I'm sorry. Dot net. Dot. I'm sorry. <laughs> Writingshorts.net. <laughs> Let's get around. I want to send you like porn site or something. Anyway. <laughs> uh, I don't know why I said that. Um, and I talked about how a novel is like a bird's eye view. We like have a garden and the novel's a bird's eye view. And you can see everything that's happening in the garden. And you can see the gardener over here and maybe a couple in love over here. And then over here's a bird bath. And, um, and you can see that. And so that's the whole story of everything that's going on. But in a short story, it's more like you're peeking through the keyhole in the gate. And all you can see mm -hmm. is the bird bath. And when you focus on the bird bath, you see the birds that are bathing in the bath, and then you see the cat that's sneaking up. So, like to me, the short story is that smaller story with that focuses on, on one shattering moment. Um, hmm. Yeah, let's talk. 
Go ahead. Let's, let's, I know that you want to talk about the shattering moment. James. Yes. I just wanted to say, um, talk about that shattering moment because that's a concept that you picked up from, um, what is the name of that book, Tina? Oh my gosh. It's so long. It's by yeah. James Scott Bill, Bell. Uh, how to write a short story and further your career. And that's not the entire title. Um, <laughs> but it's really long. It's like a the title takes up the whole cover of the book. It's so long. Um, but if you look up Sh James Scott Bell and short story writing, it, it's green with white letters. You'll find it. Yeah. And I think that the shattering moment it, is kind of what Rhonda was referring to as like the climax, because like in a normal story structure, there's introduction, rising action, then a climax, and then a long kind of fall off to wrap everything up at the end. And um, so, I mean, James Scott Bell, his, he calls what we would normally say is the climax of the story, the shattering moment. But <clears throat> he contends the shattering moment can have happened before your short story even begins. And then your short story is the people reacting to a shattering moment that you, the, the reader only knows happened based on what is told in the short story. So uh, it, the whole format is different according to him. You would change everything around as far as how you structure your story. Right, you could put the shattering moment in the beginning, the middle, the end, um, or before the story begins. And the story is about the what the fallout that that's his word um, of the shattering moment. Okay, so um, do you guys think that that is helpful, or do you think do you disagree with that 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 is like a very important part of a short story? I think so. I think it's very important. Yeah. Can you think of a short story that you read that had a shattering moment that you, um, well, the problem is if you talk about the shattering moment, it's more or less a spoiler. <laughs> I mean, I'll talk about, you know, um, if everybody is familiar with O. Henry and the gift of the Magi where, mm -hmm. so the girl goes and cuts her hair so she can buy a chain for her husband's pocket watch. And mm -hmm. then he sells his watch so he could buy like a ribbon for her hair. Yeah. So I would wonder what the shattering moment is. I suppose it's when the two of them exchange their gifts and realize what had happened. Correct. Right. And it's interesting because in that piece, the deliciousness is the buildup of like, oh no, because we see it coming. And then we wonder like, what will they do when they realize that this has happened? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, All right. And one, another one that's a good example, and they talk about it in every literary writing class you'll ever take, is the hills like white elephants um oh. where the shattering moment has actually already happened mm -hmm. um and they're just they're sitting in a train station having a conversation mm -hmm. um waiting for the train and it's like five minutes five ten minutes that they're waiting for the train but yeah, you don't really realize <laughs> what happened until the end of the mm -hmm. story so the shattering moment had already happened but you don't know that what happened until the end of the story. So that's a really good example. Yeah. Well, so, so far we've been talking about writing for um, publication into a magazine or an anthology or something like that, where there's a word count where they say we only want stories up to however many words. But I just would like to throw out there that normally if I'm going to write a story, I sit down and start the story and, and when I'm done, I mean, there's nobody that says, you know, if you're going to sit down and write a short story, it has to be 3000 words or it has to be a thousand words. A sh short story can be a <clears throat> hundred words or even four words. Um, I think Ernest Hemingway wrote that story, baby shoes for sale, never mm -hmm. used six words. You know? yep. Yeah. And um, so do you guys think that there's a sweet spot for short story length? Do you have much experience in writing them and what, and do you know what your sweet spot is? Uh, me personally, I completely agree that you need to just write the story until it is over. But um, when you're writing for a market though, that you don't have that option really. So how would you, how would you fill it in? If, if you had a story and it was six words, but you had to write 2000 words, what would you fill it in with? Would you add characters? Would you add backstory? Um, make it wordy? What would you do? Yeah. So, <clears throat> well, I guess the best way to answer that question is to take the first 
the problem is that set, that story is done in my opinion. <laughs> so I likely would decide that I would tell a story about this, this person who wrote the ad when they were younger. And I would just kind of do a little bit of exploring and see what kind of comes out because I did tackle that same Beatles call for submission. And I, and I sat down and I started to write with just an inkling of an idea and just followed where like the story took me. And, um, and then, you know, if I can't sit and write something until it's finished and I get up and go do dishes or drive around or something, my mind will change about the direction that it's supposed to take. And I'll try to take it this way and I'll try to take it that way. And then just kind of whichever storyline is feeling like the right one is the way that it goes. Or I'll run into a snag. For example, I was going to reference a song and then later found out, oh, the Beatles didn't write that song. <laughs> 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 and so that kind of changed the way that I took things. That's a snag. But in general, I mean, I think there's some pretty solid guidelines for writing short as opposed to writing long, right? So, I mean, mm -hmm. we had mentioned you have to grab the reader right away. There's not really a lot of time for big, long backstory about your characters, right? I mean, you, mm -hmm. have, to, you have to get them interested a lot more quickly with, with a lot fewer words. Wouldn't right. you say that's true? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And speaking of characters, would you limit how many characters? I mean, well, would you just try to stick with one or two or? I might anyway, just when it comes to like writing a novel, I don't like for there to have a whole bunch of characters hopping around. But for mm -hmm. sure, if you're writing short, I, I wouldn't think you have a whole lot of room to have a whole big bunch of characters. And I, and I go ahead, Tina. I would say definitely one point of view. Yes, I would mm -hmm. agree with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't, I can't think of any short stories that I've read that had more than one point of view. Mm -hmm. And you don't have as much time either to do a whole big bunch of world building. I mean, if you're going to be doing fantasy, you have to be really clever about getting that world um, into the mind of your reader without spending a whole lot of time describing what your map looks like in your fantasy world, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, you, your plot also has to be a lot more concise. Um, you asked so me earlier how I go about writing a short story. and. You know, I always start with the shattering moment in my mind. I, I know what my shattering moment is, and I know what my opening hook is going to be, and I know what the final payoff at the end is going to be. Um, and then I just sit down and with the idea in my head of how, if there's a like a word count um, limit, then I try to just kind of subconsciously keep that in my brain. And then if I go over, then I will go back and take out extraneous words, you know, like whatever. I tend to be wordy sometimes. So mm -hmm. That's quite easy <laughs> yeah. for me to do. Okay. I love adverbs. I am an adverb addict. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So Maria brings up a good question. First of all, she mentioned earlier that she is traditionally published to answer a question uh, with a small house. And she just mentioned that my style is adult novels, so writing short is a real struggle for me. So that makes me wonder, is there really a better genre for short stories? I don't know about better. Um, okay, and here's here's the thing. I try to, I try. Okay, so I mostly sit down and I write a thousand words every day. And for a while, I was trying to do a different letter of the alphabet for every story that I wrote. And so I have a whole lot of like starts. So um, I just don't wait around until I have a shattering moment in my mind because I'm telling myself, well, I'm going to write today. So, you know, like maybe the shattering moment will appear. But as far as genre, uh, I mean. I think literary fiction um, does really well with short stories. Okay. Really? Well, well I mean, <clears throat> yes. I think that people who read literary fiction tend to appreciate them. How about that? And I think that there's like a market. And also I think like science fiction, but see, and the reason why I'm having such a hard time is because I've, I've thought and seen short in just about every genre. I don't think it works maybe so well for romance mm -hmm. because I think you kind of want that, that teasing, mm -hmm. long, drawn out, will they or won't they get together, even though you know they will. But do you know what I mean? I would think that that genre wouldn't lend itself so well mm -hmm. to short. Okay. Um, well, Jennifer has chimed in and said that 
she likes to start with a shattering moment too, like you, Tina. And she also likes um, Edgar Allan Poe's shoes. So shorts. I don't know what that means. She says but, shorts. Oh, shorts. shorts. Oh, sorry, Jennifer. <laughs> Um, <laughs> he probably had great shoes, though. Yeah, I bet he did. Really, they really, probably, probably all other. Dewey's a starving artist, you know. Yeah, yeah. They were probably really. Them. They were probably really uncomfortable shoes, and that's why he was so sad all the time. Yeah, or cranky, whichever. And he was. Burying people under the floorboards <laughs> and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, hearing things. Oh. And, um, okay, so I was thinking, uh, you're probably right about romance because you've got to have time to fall in love with the people. But what about um, fantasy? I mean, there's so much world building in fantasy. Do you steer away from that? I think it really just depends. I mean, if you're writing for a market where the whole magazine is a fantasy magazine and people are coming in with the attitude already that a lot of times it's a world that's already sort of kind of been established, right? And mm -hmm. you're just contributing a piece to fit in with that whole mindset. A lot of times your reader will help you out by carrying into the experience an expectation. It's so funny because I've thought about, oh, writing a dragon story. Well, did you know that there's like all of this dragon um, accepted lore? It would be kind of like walking into like uh, a situation where you're supposed to write a Star Wars episode and, and you throw Star Trek stuff in there, people would like hate you forever. Yeah, so. of course. <laughs> There's a lot of research you have to do to make sure that you don't offend people who know. No, that is not Duh. the right word. That is not the right word. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! For a female dragon or something like that, or their was, eggs. I'm sorry, I thought you were done. No, that's okay. I was just listening to the Story Grid podcast. I love that last night, I, and they were talking about just this thing. Um, where there are conventions in different genres and yes. especially in fantasy, you know, you can't mix like a star Wars type work. Like if you were watching a star Wars movie and this is exactly mm -hmm. what they said. And all of a sudden Luke Skywalker threw a fireball out of the palm of his hand. Everybody would be like, what? You can't do that. <laughs> right. Even though it's a complete fantasy world that someone made up, made up there's rules and the rules have been established and you cannot break the rules. Yeah, my kid, um, you know, he is involved in a lot of gaming and stuff like that. And and even these games have what's called lore behind them. And, and you cannot violate the lore. So I think that fantasy people may have a little bit of an advantage if they're educated in their genre and well-read in their genre. And I think that maybe that's part of the key is to read widely in your genre um, the short stories that have already been gone before you. You know, the people have already blazed that trail. Right, if you're writing your short story about a dragon or about a wizard or um, so a, a type of fantasy world that's already been established by multiple authors and the rules are already known, then you really don't have to spend as much time on world building. All right, Good so, point. I mean, I'm not sure if we really answered the question about if... Mm -hmm if there's genres that are better suited to short stories or not. Um, but I would like to talk about some advice for people who are looking to start writing maybe their very first short story. Um, I have eight pieces of advice from Kurt Vonnegut. Do you guys have anything to throw out there before I get into this sort of list? No, I'd love to hear that. All right. So if you've never read any of Kurt Vonnegut, I'm sorry for you, but give it a try. Um, <laughs> Let's see. So he says, use the time of a total stranger in such a way that he or she will not feel like their time was wasted. So is the reader advice? by that or the character? The reader. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's good advice for people who are doing podcasts also. We <laughs> 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 yes. Don't we talk about that all the time? Like we want to have something of value for the person that's tuning in. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, give the reader at least one character he or she can root for. Hmm. I would say, well, I was going to say, or against, but would a story work with only a bad guy and not like a good guy to root for? What do you think? Hmm. Well, yeah. I agree with you, Jamie. Like I only a bad guy you think could work? In the short story, if there's a bad guy to root against, it, that would hook me. Mm -hmm. Then it says, now this one, this I've always struggled with. Every character should want something, even if it's only a glass of water. 
And I think that the reason I struggle with this is because that kind of a want, like I specifically want a glass of water, really tripped me up because I couldn't get into the psychological, well, what do you mean that they want something? Like it could be sort of a deeper want, something subconscious, if you know what I mean. For well, example, I think it's whatever is motivating them to do whatever it is they're doing in your story. So when I hear that, I think of a guy lost in the desert for days and he's really thirsty and he would do anything for a glass of water. Yeah. And then, and that is what is driving him to, I don't know, run towards that oasis that's not really there, whatever it is. Right. And I suppose um, my, go ahead, Rhonda. Before we get much farther, Robin mentioned that villains are the heroes of their own stories. So, ah, very good. That is also a very good point. I just feel like the pressure to give every character in the story a want, like the want of a glass of water, is what I'm saying always tripped me up. Because fine for your main character, that's very obviously going to drive your whatever, whatever. But like, so where I got a little bit of clarity on it was when I was writing this piece about the Beatles. And even though, you know, you're only talking about one person at a time or something, there's obviously four people, at least in the story. So it helped me to reframe it like, well, they all want to be famous. So do you understand? It wasn't exactly like a physical need that they wanted to satisfy. It wasn't like, please hand to me a glass of water. I was having a hard time with just, and I, and I guess because of the way the question or the statement is phrased, like to me, make these people real people that aren't just flat on the page. And I think to get to the writer to the place where they're doing that, people say, make them want something which makes you then explore the character deep enough to know what it is that they want. Am I making any sense? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay, here's a writing prompt for you, also from Robin. Overly thirsty random employee walks into the lunchroom just <laughs> as the hero goes to kiss the lady, interrupting that perfectly romantic moment. I'm hooked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go, ahead, go write that, Robin, because we want to hear it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's her word count limit? Should we give her word count limit? 2,500 words or something? Yes. <laughs> All right. And Maria writes young adult fantasy. Mm -hmm. uh, ah. And she says, uh, I think it might be more new concepts that might make it more tricky for short stories. Because yeah. I wrote young adult fantasy for Nano, but I had a few new concepts for then novels. The world, the world building took quite a while. Ah. Uh, mm. Now, I'm not sure. What does she mean by more new concepts? Is that just more she, new thoughts I'm in the world? I'm guessing she was making up a world that hadn't oh. existed before. All right. I wasn't thinking of it that way. Okay. Now, here's a piece of advice that I think was super helpful from Kurt Vonnegut. Every sentence must do one of two things. Reveal character or advance the action. Mm. I thought that was super mm. helpful. That's great advice. Because when you go through the edit and you're wondering what's the water that you can boil away out of this chicken noodle soup, if it's not revealing character or advancing action, it can go. Even if you think it's the most beautifully crafted piece of writing you ever created. Kill, kill your, your darlings. darlings. Yes. Jinx, you owe me a Coke. Okay. He also advises, and I don't know how I feel about this, start as close to the end as possible. Hmm. That's uh, kind of your keyhole theory a little bit, Bambina, is mm -hmm. more or less, you know, condensing the story down. All right. right. So, and then here's also, I think, a great piece of advice. And this is for more, I think, of coming up with what's going to happen in my story as opposed to, like, the editing process. Be a sadist. No matter how sweet and innocent your leading characters make awful things happen to them in order that the reader may see what they are made of. Mm. I love that one. That is a wonderful piece of advice because, yeah. you know, especially if you, if you have your shattering moment, but really nothing else to go along with. <laughs> well, let's see. Maybe he could drop an anvil on his toe or something. Yeah, what horrible thing can happen to this protagonist? All right. Um, let's see. Rhonda, we can't hear what you're saying. You got yourself muted there. I know. My husband's in the kitchen right now and he's being pretty noisy. So I've got myself muted. Uh, I'll be gotcha. back in a moment. All right, so let's see. And then, oh, I lost my outline. 
right to please just one person. If you open a window and make love to the world, so to speak, your story will get pneumonia. Hmm. How do you feel about that? So, I mean, I think a lot of times as Christian, our audience of one as Christian indies is going to be God. Um, but so writing to please just one person, do you think he meant yourself? Do you think he meant ones like, so, you know, Rhonda, you're hoping that your story will be pleasing to your husband, for example. So you're writing a story, you know, he will love, right? So you think he's talking about an audience person or is he talking about the writer should write to please themselves? Well, honestly, I'm not really concerned about that <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but I do always try to make sure that my stories are pleasing to God. That is true because he's my ultimate audience. But um, I'm not really concerned about a specific. Now, if I was writing a Star Wars, which I wouldn't do, or a Star Trek, which I probably would do, story, I would definitely be concerned about that audience. But in general, the stories I write, there's going to be someone out there who wants to hear it. And it may be a small audience, but I'm... I love what he's saying, but I don't really have a specific audience in mind when I'm writing it. I think Maybe I should. What he means is to know who your audience is. Mm -hmm. I think so and too. If yeah. you can picture somebody that you know that is falls into the like, okay, so I just had to fill out this application right for the book coach, and what they want. One of the questions was, "Who is your target audience?" Like they wanted specifically to know who my target audience was. So I said, middle-aged Christian women who like to read Christian fiction. So if I could think of somebody I know, like there's a lady at Jennifer's church who's, every time I see her, is your book done, is your book done? So like I could picture her when I'm writing and and so then I have a picture of basically a represent representation of my audience. Yes, and I think that that's very freeing when you're not worried about, um, making someone happy who typically wouldn't read in your genre. Like, why would you then, you know, make choices about your plot or your characters based on what they would like? That would be mm -hmm. just a silly waste of time. All and right. So, especially in my novel, there's a lot of nuances um, that somebody who didn't understand um, the story of Moses and the Old Testament might not pick up on. And right. so I struggled with, well, do I need to explain uh, why they rebuilt the tabernacle in the Alaskan wilderness or do I just say they did it? And, and so then I went back to, well, my audience is middle-aged Christian women right. who like to read Christian fiction. They mm -hmm. should know that. That's an excellent example. That's exactly, exactly why it's important to know your audience. Yeah. That's Good. a great example. Um, and the final piece of advice Kurt Vonnegut gives, and we have a link to the source where I picked this up from. Um, we'll put it with the video at some point. Um, give your readers as much information as possible, as soon as possible to heck with suspense. Readers should have such complete understanding of what is going on, where and why that they could finish the story themselves. Should cockroaches eat the last few pages? Ah. <laughs> wow. That's really interesting. I've heard variations of that advice in multiple places. So then, I mean, I guess that would argue against a sort of O. Henry type of story with like a surprise twist ending, wouldn't it? Hmm. Unless that's your um, whole purpose mm -hmm. for writing the story is to have mm -hmm. a twist ending. Mm -hmm. I think that um, I've heard, I heard um, professional editors say um, some of the best books tell you what happens at the end in the first paragraph. Hmm. Do they let you know they're telling you that? Yeah, it says, you know, the day that I fell out of the spaceship and died. Oh. You know, or, mm -hmm. I don't know. I guess you don't fall out of the spaceship. <laughs> yeah. But you know well, what I'm saying? If he was a red shirt, he would. <laughs> um, like, the day that I died started out like any other. You know, like, okay, so we know that we're going to read this whole story about what happened to this day, the day of this character, and that at the end, he's going to die. Well, all I have to say is I found that piece of advice very freeing because I don't think I know how to do suspense. Like, it, write a suspenseful story. I think I would just freeze because I feel like, what? How do you even, ah, uh, I, I just, I guess I don't read enough suspense to really understand yeah. even how you would start. 
I don't know. So anyway, I was really happy to hear that I could say to heck with suspense. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, okay. So I have a question about what Tina just said. And Robin also, she's saying, isn't that essentially info dumping? So A, and then B, does that also go along with mystery writers? Well, if you're writing a short story, remember. So mm -hmm. remember, this is in the context of like 5,000 words. Well, that's true. So, um, I mean, I'm sure a mystery that you wrote in a very short amount of words would mm -hmm. totally, totally be laid out differently than, you know. Remember the Encyclopedia Brown story? Uh, yeah. I love those stories. And aren't uh -huh. they, they're probably not even 10,000 words. Those books are so skinny. Yeah. When you see them now, like I used to think that yeah. they were such a big deal. And the font is like, got to be like 24 <laughs> yes. or something. And then the illustrations are full page. And, yeah. yeah. And those, those were fun and those were mysteries. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, did they give you as much information as soon as possible that the reader could finish? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess the reader could wrap it up with whatever ending they want and whatever killer they wanted it to be. I suppose right. the point is you don't need to put in a whole big lot of filler of, you know, the dawn broke on the purple lilac, blah, 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 mm -hmm. unless it's important that the reader knows about the purple lilacs. Right. Right. And I think that what is, what is the goal of a short story and why is he giving these eight pieces of advice so that you will write stories people want to read, correct? Mm -hmm. That's true. Mm -hmm. And to answer Robin's question, I don't think that he was meaning to, when he said give them as much information as possible, I don't think he meant like dumping info. I meant, I think he meant like, don't withhold what's happening and make them have to figure it out. Mm. Be really clear, make it clear exactly what's happening. I mean, I would agree with you because of how it ends with if the cockroaches ate the last few pages, would the reader feel like they could probably guess what was going to happen? Right. Um, okay, so I think that that's pretty interesting advice. Um, you know, there are a couple points in there. Uh, well, maybe, maybe not. But um, then again, I'm not sure how much our audience has experience with writing short stories. I would encourage everybody to take a take a crack at it because it's so much different than writing a novel and can really be a refreshing break. And especially if you're in the murky middle or you're in the middle of editing and you just feel like you're terrible and you're horrible and you don't write well, take a minute and write a short story and hand it to someone that is a good audience and you will get some nice feedback to hopefully keep you going. All right. And so we only, um, we're to, it's time to switch gears, ladies, unless you have more to say about writing short stories, because we have to share the writing that we did before mm -hmm. we started. So you guys good with that? I have a lot right. to think about. Awesome. Um, Tina, do you want to talk about what we did today for our uh, writing prompt? So we decided that since we were talking about short stories and short stories are short. <laughs> and the reason we were talking about short stories is because Jamie and Rhonda are, were writing a short story with a clear word count goal that um, a drabble would fit really well into today's episode. So a drabble is you have to write a story and it has to be exactly 100 words, not 98, not 99, not 101. It has to be exactly 100 words. All right. So, That's a pretty strict word count limit. Yeah. And so we generated three words that we're, we're supposed to inspire us and extra points if we actually use them. All right. And so, I forget what they were. So Jennifer, you always go first. Where's Jennifer? Oh, <laughs> Jennifer, did you did you write a hundred words in fifteen minutes exactly? No, I didn't. Oh well, then we don't want to hear your story. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just I'm excited kidding. to hear yours, all though. Oh, okay. Well, I'll go first because of the three of us, I was the only one that did not manage to get my story to a hundred words, which really irritates me because <laughs> this is not my first time trying to write a drabble, and I. I knew I could do it, but I guess not in 15 minutes. And you're the short story expert of the group. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So that thanks that for pointing bad. that out. Thanks for pointing out, Tina. That's great. <laughs> Although, love you, Jamie. I did, um, I did erase those words so they wouldn't count into my word count. So someone else, Jennifer, why don't you tell us what the words were? <laughs> 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 okay. I will tell you. The words were difficult battle news. So difficult battle news should be the theme of everybody's story. Yes. Okay. 
So here's what I came up with. And for the record, it is 107 words. I was working on whittling out those extra seven words when the timer went off. It's so frustrating. Okay. There was some difficulty with identification. I'm sorry about the delay. She said nothing. We'd been joined by silence, grief's persistent companion, and I knew she was loath to chase him away. The three of us, the officer, the widow, and the silence, abided until my shaking legs compelled me to stand. If there's anything I can do, ma'am, I started to say, but the door opened and a little boy with a butch haircut chased silence away. Mom, I aced my test. Ain't that swell news? The boy's eyes fell on me. You a friend of Pops? I found myself longing for the return of silence. Wow. wow. That did not seem like 100 words. 107 words. Well, in fact, I think I might chop out him saying that he aced his test and that might put me at 100. Mm -hmm. He might just look up and say, you a friend of Pops. Right. And then the moment might be even more just poignant that that's, that's what he says to chase silence away. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it just seems so full. I mean, it doesn't seem like just 100 words on a page. It seems like a story that I've been listening to for a while. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, sense? thank it's you. It's a complete story. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's that's very, because um, I had compelling. seven extra words. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, I'm glad that you guys liked it. Just for the record, if I took out those words, I'd be at 98. And I think I like it like that. And then mm -hmm. I would have to put in two, two more to make it an even mm -hmm. 100. But that's that's basically what you do for a drabble is you... You try to take exactly a hundred words and tell a, a story. Awesome. So, yeah, I knew these would be short. So, <laughs> so I was like, we can go a little longer before we start with the feedback mm -hmm. time. All right. So uh, who wants to go next? Go ahead, Tina. All right. I did have exactly a hundred words. Yay. And quite... she was done early. Yeah, I was like texting. Was, like, what am yeah, I doing myself? for those of you oh. watching, don't feel bad if you if you can't do it because it's not easy. It's not easy if you have you know fifteen hours sometimes because you're trying to concentrate this whole big thing that you might have in your head into a hundred words. Okay, go ahead. I'm not sure it's a complete story, but here goes. How did I get myself into this difficulty? I wondered as I made my way through the dense underbrush beside the river. Not paying attention again, I chided myself. I crouched down, crouched down behind an especially lush bush and peered out through its branches. Two bull moose snorted and stomped in the middle of the path I'd been walking on, horns locked in the age-old battle over who would get the girl. Where exactly was that girl? I pulled out my camera, careful not to draw attention to myself. I didn't want to be fodder for the six o'clock news. Nice. That's complete, right? Jamie, would you say it's complete? I think so. I mean, we we find out at the end that she's a photographer. Mm -hmm. What would what? How would we? And identify? then she's got a goal to not be, you know, news. <laughs> when she when she said she found a bush, and then she said peered, I really thought she was going to say <laughs> that she peed behind the bush. <laughs> Tina wouldn't write something like that. Uh, yeah, I would actually. <laughs> So I thought that that's what she was talking about. Her predicament was that she had to go to the bathroom. No, she was walking down the path and ran into the two bull moose fighting and got too close. Okay, so Tina, I, you said when you finished, when the timer went off, that you didn't finish your story. So tell us why you think it's not a complete story. I'm just not sure what, what this shattering moment is. Hmm. Maybe um, it happens after the story is over, which is allowable. You know, the encounter with the female moose, whoever she is. I mean, you kind of Im you imply that there's a possible for something bad to come. Right. Yeah. And then you find out that she's put herself there. So it's sort of a stress relief a little. Mm. I mean, I didn't find myself like, well, what happened? So, mm -hmm. I mean, I felt like it, it had an ending. I don't know. I wonder what the people who are listening think. Do you think that's a complete mm -hmm. story? Did it have mm -hmm. a beginning, a middle, and an end? Interesting. And a shattering moment? Hmm. 
I, I just know. I would think the shattering moment was the moment she looked up and saw the two bull moose and realized she was in danger. Hmm. But I but, thought that's why she was hiding. Right. She yeah. Okay. Into I the see. Bushes. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think when a shattering moment to me is sort of like almost what you would call a paradigm shift. Like I'm thinking one way and then I found out, uh, no, this is actually happening to me. Maybe I'm looking at it wrong. I don't know. I mean, if you think about when Jennifer talks about disasters that happen in her novel, they're not always things like tornadoes or earthquakes. It's a disaster is just an event that kind of happens to make mm -hmm. things. It's like a catalyst for something different to happen. Right. So, mm -hmm. So I feel like shattering moments don't necessarily have to be like earth shattering. I so I don't know. Right. That's a question for the ages. <laughs> well, I think I think what Rhonda said can be a shattering moment, but I don't think it has to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Jennifer believes that it's complete, and Robin also thinks that it's complete. And Jennifer um, says that she peed. Or wait, maybe <laughs> she's talking about the peed comment for me. Maybe that's what she's saying. Okay, that could be it. Oh boy. Yeah. This is how rumors get started. <laughs> uh, you did hear a story from a couple weeks ago, right? This is totally mm -hmm. paybacks today. Okay. Um, all right. So let me just catch up the chat just super quick. Um, Wait a minute. Rob Everything that Jennifer says, you have to put on and say as Jennifer. Okay. I will. I will. Okay. Um, all right. So Robin let us know that she had a short story published in a charity anthology in April called Wishful Inkers. Is that a great Ooh, name or what? I love that. Yeah. So we got to find great. that. Um, let's see. Maria says congrats to her. And then, uh, like I said, Jennifer. Th oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hang on one moment. <laughs> Jennifer's in the room. Okay. That was a complete story. And also <laughs> I have to tune out. What about the one where she said, I'm so glad I didn't have to do this prompt. Oh, yes, yes. I am so glad I didn't do this prompt. I have way too many words for that. Okay. That's terrific. All right. Awesome. All right. So, Rhonda, your turn um, to tell us what you, let's hear yours. Now, Rhonda also finished and said, oh, I didn't get a complete story. So everybody listen and see if they think Rhonda's story is complete. So here we go. Yeah. Um, and I will mention earlier that when you were talking about, um, ending stories at the climax or the shattering moment, she said that she really enjoyed that. So I hope she likes my story today. Yay. Jennifer thinks you're stalling. Oh, well, she does put your, me. put it, put the mask on and say you're stalling. <laughs> Okay, Rhonda, you're stalling. <laughs> Get a move on. Okay. <laughs> All right, go ahead. All right. <clears throat> a single event from last month flashes before my eyes. I can't say no to people I love. She puts the roster in front of my face, and alas, my personality doesn't suddenly change, although I will it to. I must conquer this battle of the mind someday, but I push it back, way back. I take the pencil she offers and scribble my name on the line, but sloppily. A tad passive aggressive, I smirk. Back in the present, I feel a burning on the side of my face. My tongue tastes like mud. See, I told you so. That's it. <laughs> and 100 Wait a words. Minute. Exactly 100 words. Wait a minute. I need Jennifer's little face thing oh. and I need to ask Is this story about me, Rhonda? <laughs> I just dropped her. Hang on. You dropped uh, Jennifer's Jennifer, head? Jennifer, you just slid across my floor again. <laughs> Quit now the other side her. of her face is... Oh, stop. <laughs> okay. Rhonda, that was the best story I've ever heard. <laughs> I loved it. I wish you would finish it. But Jennifer, is it complete? Did you think it was a complete story? <laughs> Definitely. It is award-winning. I love Jennifer. it. Oh, this is hilarious. Jennifer said, I hate you. And <laughs> YouTube held her oh, comment you for so we can review it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to approve it. <laughs> Hate speech. Oh, so <laughs> um, but was it was that a story about Jennifer's uh, softball experience? Oh, could you tell? Was that obvious? <laughs> That's why <laughs> I taste mud. <laughs> oh man! Oh, but she word. never passively aggressively write her name on a on a roster. <laughs> or if she, would, she would write it extra clearly. <laughs> oh, right. One N, two N. Yep. <laughs> Not Jenny. Oh. oh, my. Okay. So, anyway. 
All right. So ladies, I really think that that was super fun and I hate to bring the jovial laughter to an end, but it is time to visit the accountability corner and to see if anybody did what they said that they were going to do to advance their writing career since the last time we were together. So Bambina, how did your week go? Did you achieve your goals? What are your new goals? What were my goals? Hmm. Well, I, um, Mostly showed up for office hours, except for once when I slept in because my phone died. Um, and I've been, <laughs> I've been making progress on my revision. Um, and then and then when I found out I was going to get this coach, I kind of slowed down a little bit. because I don't want to have to go redo it if they say, oh, well, we have to do this. And I was working on that application, so I had to, like, submit tons of pages of my writing and I had to do like answer this whole questionnaire. Um, so, but I feel like I made progress this week in my career. So, so you're happy with uh, what you accomplished. Yes, I am. And, and so going forward, I just, um, I guess I can't really make that decision until I talk to this, these people tomorrow and see what's going to be required of me. Well, I mean, are there other things that you could decide that you're going to work on that are specific and measurable? For example, I am going to, this is just something I'm pulling out of the air because this is not a goal I would ever have. I am going to get 25 new subscribers to my newsletter, or I am going Mm -hmm. to post three times to my Facebook group or something like that, right? Because, I mean, it's easy enough to say, well, I guess I'm off the hook for doing any work until I finish blah, blah, blah for this writing right. post person. But you don't want to get stagnant and you want to capitalize on momentum that you have, right? Right. Well, um, I guess the thing was that they said it could take four, up to four weeks to get accepted. Um, so if it was going to be four weeks, I'm going to continue with my revision the way I've been doing it. Um, and that's, what I'm, that's going to be my goal. If it's they're going to be like, well, we'll start on Monday, then I will. My goal will be to do to work on whatever assignment they give me on Monday. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And right. so that's what I'm going to. I'm going to be revising one way or the other. All right. So, what's the specific and measurable goal that you can state right now, so we could check in with you on Thursday and make sure you did it? Uh, I want to get at least three chapters revised. There we go. There we have it. All right. So turnabout is fair play. So if you would like to ask me the same question in about two minutes, fair enough. I will admit that I did not. I, my goals totally got destroyed because of this call for submission. I got into this Beatles story and I just kind of got obsessed with it, but kind of in a fun and good way. It was great for me because it's been a really long time since anything that I wrote pleased me as much as this piece. And so even though I did not meet my goals, which I believe was to have polished up five of my lounging in the back burner short stories that I have just sitting there, um, I am so happy to just feel good about writing again. That is a way bigger accomplishment than anything else I could have done this week. So bad news and shame on me for not meeting my goal, but I think it was for a very good purpose. Well, so, I don't agree that it should be shame on you because I think our goals also mm-hmm. need to be flexible. Mm-hmm. And when things like that come up, then we should have that flexibility to say, okay, I'm going to put this aside and I'm going to work on this because um, you were writing. And you were writing for um, possible publication, and it was an excellent story. So I oh, feel you. like even though you put that other goal aside, that you still were successful this week. Mm-hmm. Well, I appreciate that. I feel like it's really an interesting um, trait and characteristic of a human being to try to balance um, grace and mercy with accountability. And um, so I suppose if you can look at goal setting and kind of be Martha and Mary about it, that's terrific. Um, And be like, well, what's more important? Mary sitting at the feet of Christ and learning and not all the busy doing that uh, Martha is running about, right? Mm -hmm. But I feel like, how do you then make sure that you eventually get something done? (laughs) 
in the practical mm -hmm. real world of it. So it's really an interesting balance because if you, if you let yourself off the hook too many times and you say, well, it's okay that you didn't meet your goal. How long before I'm sitting here next year and all of those stories are still not finished. You know what I'm saying? Like how many mm -hmm. times can you allow yourself? 70 times seven. I'm going to, mm -hmm. that's how many times <laughs> I'm going to allow myself. <laughs> That's how many times I'm going to allow myself to not meet or to change my goal. But I do mm -hmm. appreciate the sentiment behind what you're saying, because that is how I feel. I feel like this week was a success, even though I did not meet that original goal. Mm -hmm. But you just changed your goal. When you found out about this submission, Paul, you changed your goal. And I think that's fine. And I mean, here you are reporting to us that you changed your goal and you met that goal. And so now we're going to hold you accountable going forward. I know I'm so I'm so, I I just can't even tell you how good it felt and that's why I want to encourage everybody if you're stuck in whatever current project you're doing now again a lot of people will hop from project to project to project and never get to the end but sometimes you just really need to take a break from what you're doing and try something completely different just to remind yourself that you love doing this that you at least like doing it or <laughs> or and that you gotta you, follow where the muse takes you got to you got to just do what it takes to move your career forward and not just get hung up in the um murky middle or whatever. All right, so for next week, um I'm going to give my last week's goal another shot because I feel I feel like energized and excited. So, I may write five new totally different stories and have them polished or whatever, but the point is um I would like to set that goal again and try to finish up five of these before next Thursday. So Rhonda, how did you do? Well, you said we could ask how to keep you accountable. What do you want us to ask you? If I finished five stories um, next Thursday, did I get them polished up? And also when we're in um, office hours, if you ask me, well, what are you, what are you working on? Which of your five stories? How is it going? You know? Okay. Awesome. All right. I'll put it in my bujo. <laughs> and what about your goals, Rhonda? How'd you do? Okay, so let me start by saying that I agree with the spirit of what Tina's saying about being flexible with your goals, but I can excuse myself by saying, well, I can be flexible way too many times. And then I end up not accomplishing anything. So I've got to be stricter with myself. And maybe you guys are, you know, at a more mature level than I am and getting this stuff done. Wait but, a second. Do you, do you forget who you're talking to? <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't say mature in every way. I just went right. in this one particular way. <laughs> um, awesome. But I, you know, when I set a goal the week before, um, if I haven't accomplished it, then since I've, I've got specific dates, I want these things done. For right now, where I am, I need to stick with the goal that I have. And my goal was to show you my cover but I worked on a different piece of art instead. <laughs> Put that on your cover. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's a great idea. Why don't I do that? I think I will. That's so um, awesome. Uh, but anyway, so right now I'm in the, um, you remember, this is the first time I've done any of this self-publishing kind of thing. So I've, I'm working on everything in the um, KDP and certain things need to be reformatted. So that's been a snag for me this week. So I did not accomplish my actual goal, but I am working steadily toward it. And I can honestly say to you guys that I've not, I'm not making excuses for myself. I did diligently do what I could to meet my goal this week. So, so do you, do you have the cover like in Photoshop, like working, like it's, it's almost done. Is it just the wrong size or? Yeah, it's sizes and some things are a little misaligned throughout the book, the actual book Ugh. and, and that sort of thing. So I just need to see if I really have to do this page by page or, you know, can I, um, slip everything into a template on Photoshop and then resubmit it or so anyway, it's totally accomplishable. Um, tasks for me. And, you know, maybe even by the weekend, I'll have it done. Okay. So, <clears throat> so your goal was to show us your cover, but you're saying the whole thing should be done by this weekend. Well, originally my goal was to show you the actual book, the proof book. In I my know. Hand. Yeah. Aww. So if I would have thought now, to actually print out the cover, 
Um, I could have done that. And I didn't even think about doing that. Oh, okay. So, but oh. um, inside your book, do you have stuff like charts or something or? Yep. Yep. Charts yeah. mm -hmm. and lots of photographs. Yeah, because I've only ever had to deal with text. I can't imagine mm -hmm. the nightmare that is trying to like put a family tree into a book <laughs> yeah. or something like that. So no wonder you're having these kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. But um, so if you're to the point where you could have printed out your book cover, you basically mm -hmm. did what you said that you were going to do. You're going to have your cover ready, right? Well, yeah. Um, what I meant to be saying was to actually show you the proof book. But Aww. if that's what you guys thought, then yes, I did accomplish my goals <laughs> of the week. So pat that's me on the I back. Heard. <laughs> so do you think that you're going to um, have the proof copy? I would think you'd be ready to order it by Thursday. Is yeah. that fair? Yes, I will definitely be able to order it. Even if I have to work 16 hours a day on this, I will have it ready to order. Good. So you might not have it in your hand, but you'll say, guess what? I ordered my proof copy on Thursday. Yes. Yes. That's and amazing. I will have the cover printed out to hold it up here and show you. Oh, because I really great. enjoyed doing this today. Yes. And since we have you with us, Jennifer, what are your goals for the week? Um, my goals are, well, I mentioned in the chat yeah, sure, already yeah. that I'm not going to fall on my face again this week, but <laughs> I don't know. We'll see if I can accomplish that. She actually said she's... <laughs> Uh, cha she's challenging herself to write a romance story by next week. <gasps> oh, fun. Uh, romance travel? I don't Prob know. It just says story. I don't Probably know. a short. I don't know. She'll have to alliterate. What yeah. That. So, Jennifer, what, what kind of a word count do you think you're going to have with your short story? I decided I'm going to do a drabble. <laughs> because I can do it. Wow. Then, wow. As I look in... As I look into your eyes, I almost believe you. You know, that printout is really good quality. Look, you could see like a sparkle in her eye and everything. I don't even know how you managed to do that. That's amazing. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have to go back to chat now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we hope that Jennifer uh, got some good news from the doctors. And yeah. um, thanks for sort of joining us, Jennifer. And for all of you who joined us in the chat, please remember well, to like and subscribe if you like what we're doing here. And since our um, chatters are giving us their goals, let's just say what they are. All right. Um, so Maria, I feel for this because I'm sort of the same way. And I believe that she's a pastor's wife too, so it might be even more difficult. But she's gone public with her pen name today, which has been a goal for her. So congratulations to you, Maria. I understand how that can be difficult. Because I, I don't advertise mine on Facebook either. So, and Robin's goal was to write five thousand words. She didn't get that, but she did get plotting done. All right. And uh, let's see. And Jennifer is gonna finish her cover, Ooh. and also write a drabble. She just said no drabble. It's oh no! I, <laughs> I must have the no must not have come through on mine. I heard her say it so. Um, I would like to say that if you are a member of Jennifer's circle of readers on Facebook, she probably will show her cover in that group. So you should go look for it. It's Jennifer Carl Tong, one and two L's. And it is a circle of writers, which stands for something like Christian indie readers or something like that. So go check it out. And again, like and subscribe our page. Tell your friends that we're here. And um, we're here to help you on your journey. Let us know how we can do that by sending us a message. If you join up uh, on our website, you can get a newsletter and some cool freebies. Also, you can support us via Patreon, only $2 a month for four extra hours plus with us wonderful, humorous, mature, sophisticated <laughs> ladies. <clears throat> do it. Do it. <laughs> Oh, so join our Patreon for bonus content. Uh, anything else, ladies, before we sign off? Um, just that we're not going to do a postcast today. So if you are looking forward to that, we apologize. We're just unwilling to do it without Jennifer. So Yeah. So it's, it's kind of creepy. It's almost like she's here. Look at her picture in the window down there. All right. So uh, that concludes this episode of the Christian Indie Writers Podcast. So until next time, may your pen be prolific. May your deadlines be met and may all of your words honor Christ. Bye now. <laughs>